Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So this is the reference interview where we discuss all topics related to small business, nonprofit, and education support. My name is Nicole Brown. I am the Assistant Manager of Reference for the St. Louis County Library. And this month, we are focusing on LGBTQIA plus led nonprofit and small business and support that comes from that. So today with me, I have Luca Kai. Is that how you pronounce your last name? I want to make sure beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they are the executive director and co-founder for Squish. Um, so we'll just launch right into the interview. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and what you do? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Luca. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm currently serving as the co-founder and executive director of Squish, the St. Louis Queer Support Helpline. Um, the name is actually kind of a misnomer because even though we started as a helpline, we've since branched into doing so many other areas of healing justice work. So we are a community-based grassroots organization uh, providing holistic support and healing spaces for queer St. Louisans to thrive. Um, we do so through six different programs that provide free, confidential, and identity-affirming emotional support, peer support, community building, resource referrals, allyship training, education, advocacy. Um, so we really um, envision a liberated future for queer people and people of all genders and sexualities in the St. Louis metro area mm -hmm. to be able to live with power, safety, and dignity. That's wonderful. So, okay. So how did you even go about forming this nonprofit? Like where, where did this idea come from and how did you feel like this um, filled an unmet need in the community? Yeah, so we did a needs assessment with the community in 2019, where we uh, did some interviews, surveys, we did a an assessment of the local data related to the St. Louis LGBTQI community. Mm -hmm. And we found that our community, even though it's like 2019 at that point, still face so many different health disparities, including medical, mental, sexual health disparities, um, feeling a lack of safety, lack of safe spaces, um, lack of spaces where we can be free from discrimination, hostility, queerphobia. So uh, I think Squish was really founded to create a, a community where we can feel um, a sense of being seen, being heard, and being able to be our true selves and the full authentic selves with each other and really tapping into community power instead of having waiting for allies to come save us um, or to rely on people in power um, to make things better, our day-to-day -day lives better. And just to be clear, like who uh, did you co-found the organization with? Yeah, I co-founded uh, the organization with Riot, um, who is a white trans non-binary social work student at the time. Um, and they've since gone on to provide other clinical supervision and therapeutic support for the organization. Um, and since then, we've also grown to be a, have three staff members, over 60 volunteers and partners. So I would say the organization has really shifted and grown. Yeah, that's that's a lot of growth. <laughs> it's like the many volunteers. Yeah. So what are the some of the challenges that you experience in this growth um, and just trying to run a nonprofit in general? Yeah, there's so many. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the challenges we face are very systemic. So um, we've did a lot of analysis around what we call what's called the nonprofit industrial complex. And what it is, it's a um, network and system of the way that the nonprofits are set up in this country to alleviate social problems um, has not really set up in a way that promotes justice, equity, and sustainability. Um, so for example, nonprofits being dependent on funding from philanthropy and from funders who are not always well connected to the communities we're trying to uplift. Right. Often nonprofits being relied on to provide direct services, but not being encouraged um, to build community power so that communities can solve their own problems instead of relying on service providers um, for the long term. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there are also so many different um, factors and pressures that pressure nonprofits to be less radical in our social justice analysis and our demands. And kind of a lot of nonprofits' politics kind of watered down to what is the most moderate or baseline we can get away with while staying operational. Yeah. So I think those are all some really big threats to nonprofits being able to achieve the mission we want to achieve. And I think the final two I'll say is um, 
there because so much social good or social justice work has been relegated to just nonprofits tackling them. There's almost this lifting of responsibility from other organizations, people, um, including for profits and corporations. When really we can't achieve social justice until we have everyone's buy-in, and it requires mass mobilization. Um, so because of that, I think. Um, nonprofits are often kind of scrambling for funding. And so they're, it's very easy to fall into a competitive mindset where we're all um, competing over a small pot of money because that's how the system has been set up in terms of um, like grant funding and, and philanthropy. Um, so I think like trying to grow an organization from the ground up has been very difficult. Um, and most other nonprofits that are big, mainstream, uh, have a lot of institutional support, usually are founded with more wealthy, well-established funders who can afford to fund at least the first couple of years of operations from their own pockets. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we could afford to do. So um, I think a lot of nonprofits get stuck in a stage of small to mid-size instead of having transformative funding to take them to another stage of organizational growth. So a lot of nonprofits actually, um, majority, I think, like either don't have staff or have less than five staff and have budgets of less than $500,000 per year. Um, yeah. And I think that really, um, like, you know, we spend so much of our time just applying for funding and fundraising. And I think um, it, it can lead to a lot of burnout. Yeah. 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 When my former life as a grant writer, I definitely yeah. saw that like they need to compete with other organizations that are doing similar work, even if they're helping other populations. You're just like, how can I market myself to get the money before they do, even though I want them to also do well? But it does set up sort of like these competing mm -hmm. uh, entities, which is not ideal. Right. Well, exactly. we're going to go a little bit more into that with grant making uh, or grant writing <laughs> later on. But before then, um, I kind of want to know how have your services changed over time? So it sounds like you've really added things as you've gotten volunteers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the shifts, any shifts in need or the challenges that you face, how has that changed your services? Yeah, I think the first thing I'll say is there's so many overwhelming needs that we see in our community, ranging from healthcare to food to housing. Um, so people's basic needs being met, but also like mental health needs, a need for a sense of belonging, to feel cared for by one's community, uh, and to feel in touch with long-lasting relationships. We know, which we know is a huge social determinant of health. Um, so amidst kind of these overwhelming needs, we really had to focus on what we're able to change, what we have the resources to change. Um, so we've really honed in on mental and holistic well-being um, as our focus. So we started out offering the peer support one line, which runs Fridays to Mondays, one to seven, providing emotional support and resource referrals. Um, then we also expanded to create and build a community-owned resource database called the Squish Book that catalogs over a thousand St. Louis resources, invites users to submit reviews, um, and is really meant to transform the way we create resource referrals and think about resources. So instead of gatekeeping them, say, behind like a resource guide that is under proprietary policies, we are making as much resource information as transparent and accessible as possible and inviting community members to shape the resource database by leaving sort of like uh, uh, like a Yelp for queer, queer people or like a Yelp for marginalized communities. Yeah. We can hold service providers accountable to our experiences. And we also started offering allyship trainings, community events, and we started a new healing justice initiative called the Starling Collective. Um, and annually, we continue to uh, train and develop a cohort of peer counselors who are queer and trans St. Louisans, building their capacity to provide peer support to each other. Um, the biggest change, of course, to all of this is COVID has been COVID. So yeah, um, that was you know, going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we know that um, there's a high overlap between queer and trans communities and chronically ill and disabled communities. Um, so I think with the pandemic, a lot of people who are not chronically ill or disabled uh, like live under the conditions that uh, chronically ill and disabled people have been living in under a long time. Um, so, you know, normalizing masking, like normalizing testing. And I think a lot of people have this mindset that the pandemic is over and that, you know, we don't have to mask anymore and there are no COVID restrictions anymore. There's also this dominant narrative that masks are cumbersome or uncomfortable, so they should be optional and we leave it up to the individual to decide. But what we've really shifted in our organizational policy is embracing disability justice in 
all of our programming. So mm -hmm. what that means is we center the people who are most marginalized and impacted by lack of access to healthcare. Uh, so, you know, we still take COVID very seriously. We still mask, require masking and require testing and distribute mask and test COVID tests at all of our events and programming. Um, and so that's really kind of shifted our norm to this new norm, which we do believe is better for everyone um, mm -hmm. that we're centering the needs of uh, disabled and chronically ill people. So all of our programming, you know, shifted towards like having some kind of virtual or hybrid option um, and having a lot more access needs met. Uh, through the programming. Have you yeah. experienced any pushback from that, from still continuing mm -hmm. those those processes and having them active in your programs? Yeah, there's a lot of pushback. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who, you know, are apathetic. And I think um, that kind of poses some barriers when it comes to partnerships. Like right. if we want to host an event together, you know, these event guidelines are important to us. But if uh, our partners are not on board, that can, you know, really make it difficult to find partners who are like-minded and values align. So mm -hmm. I will say we don't have a perfect solution. Like we have full control over our own events, but not our partners' events or programming. So we just try and influence and share resources and share yeah. our thinking with our partners wherever we can. Um, but there are definitely partners who are not on board or community members who are not on board. So that's been an uphill battle. Yeah, that's a that's a hard like to walk because you're just like I just want I want everyone to feel safe and mm -hmm. even from like a library standpoint that has been something mm -hmm. that we've like struggled with back and forth like how much mm -hmm. do we push or don't push and mm -hmm. um, trying to get the community as aware as possible and at least providing these things to folks and so that's yeah I feel you yeah, <laughs> well, I feel that actually. yeah. Um, all right so wanting to know about more about you, how long have you served in this role? Um, mm -hmm. Did you feel prepared for starting a nonprofit? Like what, mm -hmm. um, I guess, do you feel like there's any part of your personality that made you ready for this? I don't know, like <laughs> what, what, when you yeah. went into it, did you feel ready? Yeah, so I've served in this role for over four years now, since 2019 when I started the organization. Um, and I think, Every year, I feel like I'm such a noob and uh, so green at this role. I think especially the executive director role has been um, really like put on a pedestal and also overwhelmed with demands and responsibilities. So I believe that executive director roles are not sustainable. They're not really meant for like regular human beings mm -hmm. to take on. And I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good for organizations or nonprofits. And not, it's not good for EDs, especially EDs of color who... Uh, face such a high rate of attrition and burnout. So I think every year I have felt more and more prepared because of mentors and partners in the community who, um, like Sayer at MTUG, for example, Julia at Solidarity Economy, people who have really uh, taken me under their wing and shared their journey with me has really helped me feel less isolated and more supported. And they, both, all of our mentors kind of treat me as an expert in my own right and takes a really, they take a really youth empowerment approach, which I really appreciate because I'm learning from them, but I also learn to do things differently from, from, from them and like yeah. uh, in my own leadership style. Um, so I felt more and more prepared every year, both in terms of soft and hard skills, uh, like soft skills um, mostly involve like management, supervision, leadership, like delegation, um, empowering other people to become leaders in their own right instead of me micromanaging. And then I would say there's some boring, hard technical skills as well, like how to read a balance sheet, like how to like find a contractor, how to hire people, how to do interviews, um, and also like how to run a community event. So I feel like I came into this role with some like kind of baseline, like about like 10 years of community organizing, event planning, and relationship building skills. Um, so I feel like my personality, I feel very fulfilled doing this work, uh, but definitely feel like I have to learn a lot of skills on the job. Yeah. And nonprofit, because there's always need, I think <laughs> that really lends itself towards that burnout that you were talking about. Like you're always just pushing and pushing, but there's always more that can be done and mm -hmm. that can wear down on you after a while. So it's it's good to have that kind of support. Um, mm -hmm. I think through our resources as well, we really encourage people to find those mentors, network mm -hmm. with others who have the same values so that you don't feel so isolated in mm -hmm. the work and it doesn't swallow you up. <laughs> <Kind of. laughs> 
Um, yeah. Okay, can you tell us sort of about the roles within your organizations and uh, and some of the stats around your service model? Yeah, so I think we are kind of have a unique organizational structure in that we have um, a lot of volunteers and very few staff, as well as a more decentralized structure. Um, when we started out, we really aspired towards non-hierarchy, so having a completely flat structure. And we also really value consensus-based decision-making and democratic decision-making. Over time, we have found that that actually also caused a lot of burnout um, because we didn't have clear roles. And, you know, we can have clear roles and not and all of the things I just mentioned. But some of the things that, like, didn't make this work so well for us included, like, having low capacity being completely volunteer run for a long time, people coming into this work with multiple demands in their life and financial stressors. So we felt like over time, we learned that creating full-time staff positions was one of the most important ways we could increase our capacity, which is not asking queer and trans, uh, like chronically exhausted people to take on volunteer work, but instead resourcing staff to be able to do this work full time and dedicate their full selves to skill building and like really immersing yourself in this work. Um, so with that, we started creating staff positions. Mine was the first one. The second role was a digital communications manager role. And the third was a pure support organizer role. Then the staff members who've taken on this role, I, I feel have really flourished and uh, their names are Amanda and Avi. Um, so this kind of forms our core leadership team in the organization. Um, we also have over 60 volunteers dispersed throughout multiple teams, about 10 to 16 teams in the organization, mm -hmm. ranging from like a grants team, fundraising team, finance, program evaluation, to uh, outward facing teams like social media, newsletter, outreach, um, uh, and of course, our service teams, like our helpline team, training team, recruitment team. So we, uh, each staff person leads or co-leads each of these teams and then volunteers support the roles that staff play through amplifying their work, implementation support, helping to write copy, create graphics, things like that. That's very cool. I've actually never heard of an organization that's built like that. Did you have a, a role model for that or did you all just kind of like mm -hmm. develop that together? Ah, thanks for asking. Um, I think I was really inspired by student organizing. Um, and it's kind of atypical, I think, for nonprofits to model themselves after student groups mm -hmm. or student clubs. But what I saw in student groups that I thought worked well was, um, I think, even though there was like a decentralized model, there were clear roles and splitting into multiple teams to care for the operations of the organization. So you think about student groups, there's often like a treasurer, a graphic designer, a social media person, a grants or like person who writes. And so I kind of modeled Squish after some of what I saw in student group models. And then of course there were a lot of challenges applying that because student group models are, don't always parallel life outside of a campus. Yeah. Um, so we had to make adjustments. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So how about your board? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, did you, how did you develop that? How do you continue to develop that? And um, do you have any particular rules in place for like that kind of recruitment? Yeah. So I'm going to say stuff here that's like kind of a traditional, um, okay. <laughs> not, not a line of traditional wisdom around nonprofits. So we really, really tried to make the nonprofit board model work, but it really just didn't. It just fell flat for us. Um, so at the start, we have a board of three, and then we recruited and expanded to a board of six. Mm -hmm. And we, these were community members who are really passionate about Squish's mission, um, pretty new to being, being a board member. And so we tried to invest in some consultation and skill building. But what we ultimately found is that the board structure isn't really set up for success because there's so many different duties um, piled onto one entity that's expected to do everything from fiscal responsibility to legal liability to um, governing the organization to overseeing the ED to HR to um, policy management um, to fundraising. And so we just didn't really feel like the board, which is made out of volunteers, is well resourced to take on all of these roles without significant skill building or recruiting people who already have this experience, but who are usually has this kind of experience. Usually, people are more privileged with prior board experience, people who 
um, or kind of the same people being tapped on by multiple nonprofits to do this work. So they really limited our board diversity and we couldn't really make meaningful progress on our, on our diversity and representation goals as a result. Um, so instead, we wanted to invest in a leadership team um, like our staff who is fully resourced and paid to do this work. Um, and our board still supports us, but honestly has delegated a lot of the responsibilities a board is traditionally expected to do to staff and other volunteers who are more in touch with the day-to-day -day realities. Yeah. Um, we also felt like, you know, traditional wisdom about boards usually um, kind of splits up, like, uh, you know, wants staff to do day-to-day -day operations and wants board to focus on big picture governance. But we really question this wisdom, like, why can't they both be done by a similar or overlapping group of people? Like, we actually found that the people most in touch with our day-to-day -day realities who interact in most of our community are also most equipped to do the governance, to do the big picture, to do the strat strategic planning and program planning. So um, the last thing I'll say is, I think this is very, perhaps very unique to Squish, but also a lot of other thought leaders in the sector have advocated for moving away from a traditional board structure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we still have plans to maybe in the future build some kind of community advisory board or something that preserves the essence of what we like about the board structure without everything it's expected to do. So we haven't given up on it totally, but I think we really question a lot of the traditional wisdom around boards and maybe boards work well for other people. Um, I, you know, when I talk to folks at Promo, like it seems like their board um, is much more effective for them and it, it's much more beneficial for them. So um, I'd be really curious to see if other organizations have tried different models or if their board works, how, how it's different from ours. Yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot about like I, I am on a board for <laughs> Reaction Lab, and it has been a huge learning curve for me. But it does seem like there's a lot of a lot on a small group of people. So I totally agree with you there. And it's just like, without all of these skills or without recruiting specific people who know how to do those things, I don't know. I guess I don't feel very effective, very effective as a person. But I'm just kind of like, okay, well, what I can work on is trying to get them more funds and mm -hmm. know how to do budgets really well so that's something that mm -hmm. I can contribute but in general my brain also is like is there a better way to do boards in general so yeah I'm very curious how different places kind of work that out I know they're thinking about like more of a youth advisory type of model to it and having a youth member on the board and mm -hmm. heard of other organizations trying to like you know change that in different ways but then I've also heard of boards that are like 26 people and it's just like I don't know how <laughs> yeah how you do that but it seems like one of those things that you have to make it work for you mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay so next question um mm -hmm. as an LGBTQIA plus led and focused organization mm -hmm. um we're getting into those grant makers and donors kinds of things. Have you mm -hmm. experienced any hurdles with cultivating donors and also connecting with those grant makers? So we've talked a little bit about sort of the difficulties around um, the competition and um, and all of that. But for you all, have you been able to cultivate donors in the way that you wanted to, or have you had to try a different model for that as well? Yeah, so I think that's another area where We've also deviated a little bit from traditional wisdom mm -hmm. um, because we, you know, most of our donors are small dollar donors, um, less than $15. So like $5, $10 um, is really one of the most, those are some of our most common donation amounts. So, you know, traditional nonprofit advice we got was like, where can you find those wealthy donors and connect with them and, you know, like really incentivize them to make a big donation every year, do a gala and like put on this huge event. And, you know, as a small budget organization that just wasn't very sustainable for us, we found that often when we put on fundraising events, we almost had to spend as much money planning and like uh, resourcing the event compared to how much we were earning from the event. Yeah. Um, so I think we really had to diversify our financial strategies and figure out what works for us. And so for us, that was relying on community members to host fundraisers for us. Social media is something we do really well, um, spreading the word and raising awareness about the organization. So we're reaching a lot of people, even if each of them don't donate very much. Um, so donating small amounts. 
We also have a lot of different donation platforms to make donating as accessible as possible. So we know that, for example, younger folks prefer to use Venmo and Cash App. Um, and then we also have PayPal, um, Act Blue, Gift Butter. So having different ways that people can donate, including in-kind and cash donations. And then finally, we really um, prioritize general operating grants and multi-year grants to kind of reduce the hamster wheel feeling of like every time we apply for a grant, almost no time has passed. Now we have to report. And then again, we have to apply again because it's a, a, it's a single year grant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, admittedly, general operating and multi-year grants are much more rare. And then queer specific and trans specific grants are even rarer. I think uh, queer specific grants account for less than 5% of all philanthropic dollars and trans specific work is an even smaller portion of that. Um, so we've really had to um, both build stronger relationships so that people are sending a grant opportunities to us by word of mouth um, or connecting us to potential funders through word of mouth and, and building relationships, but also casting a wider net in terms of our grant search terms and then narrowing down based on our priorities, which is, you know, for a while we applied for a lot of grants that we didn't get. I think that was maybe more than 50% of the grants we applied for in the first two years we didn't get. Uh -huh. um, so I think for where we had a higher success rate and which funders were more aligned with our values and programs so that we didn't have to twist ourselves into a pretzel to try and fit funding criteria or mm -hmm. specific priorities. Um, so I think all of those things helped towards more funding sustainability. Yeah, and grant writing takes a lot of work and time and you're already doing other things. <laughs> it, it definitely takes a lot of time to do all of that. And so it's like, how do you you know, apply to the things that you have a good chance for instead of like just putting out as many applications as possible. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what are some of your goals for your organization for yourself over the next five years? Like, what are you hoping for for Squish and for you? Yeah, I think I really hope for our healing work to take off because um, I think very often we see um, you know, activists and social justice organizations are pushing for change and there's a lot like you know when we're fighting and resisting I think it also takes a lot of energy and it takes a certain kind of person to be that kind of activist but we also want to hold space for people who are quieter who want to contribute to the community in smaller softer ways in less visible ways kind of like healing the healers who are the backbone of our community. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that we, you know, learn more about healing justice and tailor our programs to the principles of healing justice, which is a movement nationwide that has been, um, I think, really on the rise in the past 10 years. Um, healing justice is, uh, from my understanding, the idea that healing cannot come without social justice and social justice cannot come without healing for the people fighting for social justice and healing looks different for everyone and there's not on a specific timeline but needs to embody the full self so mind body spirit um, ancestry etc so i i'm really excited for us to figure out what healing justice work looks like for us the other thing i'm really excited about is for the organization to move away from reliance on me as the co-founder and to develop structures that allow it to sustain itself beyond me so mm -hmm. like having more staff helps um, having more skill building for the organization helps expanding our leadership uh, developing stronger community relationships developing sustainable funding sources so that i don't have to work 60 to 80 hours a week is what i'm most excited about for myself I'm excited for that for you as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a lot of time. Um, <laughs> all right. So if someone came up to you and they said, hey, I'm going to start my own nonprofit in St. Louis, what kind of advice would you give them? Mm. Yeah, I think um, there's a book I really want to recommend here. It's called Incite the Revolution Would Not Be Funded. Um, and it's an anthology of essays about the limitations of the nonprofit format um, and trying to expand our collective imagination about what social justice work can look like beyond nonprofits. Um, so it really takes a look at um, how social justice work can happen within nonprofits, but can also be diluted or um, you know, sabotaged within the nonprofit context. Um, so you know, hopefully someone reading this would think critically about do they want to start a nonprofit or are there other formats that they can do the work they want to do? Um, you know, I think the it's 
I, I, I'm sensing it's becoming more acceptable to not have a nonprofit, but like seek fiscal sponsorship for some of the similar benefits. Uh-huh. Um, and I think also before I started Squish, I think I wish I did a little bit more like um, understanding of St. Louis court history and court theory so that I could think about what, what else I wanted to do with the skills I had and then the needs I was seeing beyond starting a helpline. Um, and I think sometimes when people want to start new services, um, I think we might end up pouring a lot of resources into creating something that is already duplicative um, as opposed to supporting something that already exists. So yeah, I think finding a specific niche and purpose for one's resources and skills can be really difficult um, as opposed to like figuring what already exists and what might be gaps. And I it's, this is starting to sound very generic. Um, and, you know, I will also say sometimes people start doing the work and then figure out that they need to pivot. And I think that's okay, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, what were you going to say? <laughs> I mean, I love that answer, actually, because I, I think that's part of what we do with helping folks. And then also with our small business conference, the mm-hmm. nonprofit like starter nonprofit first begins by telling you all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. (laughs) um, And then goes into why you can do it, you know, if you really want to. And that is a a partnership that we have with um, St. Louis public library, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, but Mm -hmm. they really start with don't do it. And then (laughs) want to do it, then, you know, think about these things because there is a lot even just in this area. So it's just kind of like, maybe you want to help, but does it have to be this way? And if you are going to do that, how can you do it in a way that like, doesn't make you work 60 to 80 hours a week? Like, what does that look like for you as well? Because you have to be able to keep going, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to talk about the book of librarians. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're planning to meet with one of our team members in the reference department to have a book of librarian appointment, which is basically like you get an hour to be with us. We'll do the kind of research you want to do. I would love to hear what do you hope to gain from that experience and sort of what you're looking for during that appointment? Yeah, um, I think I really reached out to schedule this session because I was taking a look at Squish's grant portfolio and wanting to figure out what our grant priorities are for the next year or two. Um, As we're learning more about grants, we kind of dump them on the spreadsheet where we do all of our research and then we try and prioritize from there. Mm -hmm. Over time, that spreadsheet has kind of got large and unwieldy and we find ourselves struggling to prioritize as we start receiving more opportunities and and um, more opportunities are on our radar. Um, I think we're going to have to make harder decisions about what opportunities to pass up and what to prioritize. Um, and I think when we were first starting out, we kind of went for everything that was possibly reachable and or low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, do we want to spend 20 hours writing a mini grant that's $5,000 or could we go for like a spend 30 hours writing a mid-sized grant that's $10,000. So weighing our capacity and trade-offs. I think we've also found that difficulty uh, finding values aligned funders. Um, So I think they're often like much more moderate LGBTQIA funders or healthcare or mental health funders who, you know, might not be on board for it with everything we stand for um, or everything that we want to achieve. Um, so I think getting a librarian to help us with that research and help us think through our search criteria and help us narrow down our options could be really helpful. Um, so they're avoiding groupthink uh, and like going for the same opportunities we always go for. Yeah. And just for those listening, um, through the St. Louis County Library, you have access to Foundation Directory, which is a huge database of grants nationwide. And so that's kind of one of the first uh, resources that we start with folks who are looking through grants because they're able to look to see like how much uh, money grant makers are giving, um, who they're giving to, what region are they giving. So there's a lot of information that you could get from under that. Of course, those are available within our branch. It's not available remotely, unfortunately, um, but we are able through the book librarian to help people sort of work through that very large behemoth of a database. (laughs) Okay, so do you have um, currently any current asks for the community that you'd like to discuss? Yeah, so with the summer coming up, we have a couple of new initiatives we're launching that we're really excited about. 
Um, mm -hmm. The first is a community anthology, which is a compilation of creative work submitted by queer St. Louisans. So if you're interested in supporting Squish's work and reading the work of queer St. Louis creatives, uh, we would love for folks to purchase a copy and it uh, sells it uh, on a sliding scale basis between $10 to $40, and it's going to be available digitally and physically. Um, so we'd love for folks to check that out. Uh, the second is we're launching a storytelling and fundraising campaign where we are short, uh, sharing some of the most uh, compelling and moving stories and photos from our storytelling initiative last year. So, you know, in the same vein, if you want to read about these stories, they're going to be available on our website. And if they move you, if you feel seen, if you want to support our community um, through reading these stories, uh, there's going to be an option at the end to donate as well. Finally, um, I would say, you know, we have a bunch of different offerings, including allyship trainings, community events, uh, our peer support helpline, and the Squish Book Resource Guide. So I encourage people to use these offerings, engage with them, engage with our community, and also support our work through donating, fundraising, becoming a monthly donor. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we are specifically looking for uh, donations of accessibility equipment, including any video conferencing equipment like an OWL. Um, or masks or COVID tests. And I think those equipment are, are really going to help us bring our programming to the next level and bring our programming to some of our most marginalized community members. So yeah, in short, use our programs, donate fundraise, or check out our stories and anthology. Awesome. Uh, can you remind us again of your website and uh, any of your socials? Yeah, it's uh, www.thesquish.org is our website. And we are at The Squish on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and we don't use Twitter. And our LinkedIn is a bit dead, but we have those as well. <laughs> gotcha. Um, anything else that you'd like to add before I close out? Um, I think I maybe just want to say uh, I've learned so much through doing this work with Squish. And um, every day I wake up feeling really fulfilled and energized to do this work. And a lot of that is because of the amazing staff, volunteers, and community members that I get to build relationships with and work with. So I really hope that people will join us in some way and engage, even if it's not through donating or fundraising, um, that you come to one of our events or check out our website or read about our programs or call our warm line. I think we would love to be in relationship with you. I love that. So if you are interested, in the description, you will find all of the socials, a link to their website, any of that information that you may be looking for. Um, if you're interested in getting any support from St. Louis County Library, you can, of course, go on our website, which is www.slcl.org. You can look under um, Using the Library, which has our small business and nonprofit resources, or under Research, you can find it there as well. Um, that Book a Librarian form will also be under Using the Library any kind of research that any person can want to do that includes starting a small business or nonprofit or grants things, or even just any kind of research in general, you can fill out that form. We will meet you at a library of your choice and you have one hour with us. There's no limit on how many of those that you can schedule. Um, you can just schedule them over and over again. And mm -hmm. so first week of October, we're going to have our small business and nonprofit conference. That's going to be in partnership with St. Louis Public Library. We're going to uh, each host a day each and then we're going to have a virtual day and that's always in the first week of October that we hold that so there are going to be a lot of great programs so please check back on our website or St. Louis Public's website in August to start seeing all of the classes that are going to be available. Whew. Okay <laughs> that's all I have. Luca thank you so much for speaking with us today this has been amazing. I've learned so much. Um, I wish your organization nothing but the best i look forward to to seeing all those cool things that you all have made um, and i hope you have a great rest of your day thank you nicole